Okay, so uh, good good evening and a good afternoon and a good mornings uh, for the student and also participant from all over the world. Uh, thank you very much for participating in today's seminars. Uh, my name is Daisaku Higashi, a professor at Center for Global Education at the University of uh, no, no, at Sofia University in Tokyo. Uh, I'm very happy, and I, today I'm a moderator and also organizer of this event. And I sincerely appreciate your time and commitment to make these global discussions on how to address you know, global challenge about global health governance, especially under the pandemics. So it's really about how to, how to make a solutions uh, or global solutions to the issue of the corona pandemics today. Uh, before I will ask the initial remarkers uh, to make initial remarks, I would like to make announcement that uh, we probably will post this recorded sessions in the YouTube after the session, because there are many universities that they want to see the program, but it's too early. For example, like it's a four o'clock in the morning <laughs> in Vancouver. So uh, we will post it uh, in the YouTube. So uh, if you don't want to hide your face, uh, please close your video uh, during the sessions. And if you want to hide your name, you might want to change your name at, uh, as well. Uh, but other than that, uh, you can show your face and the, uh, so that it's easier for Maria to make a lectures. Uh, in terms of the audio, so please make it mute so that we don't have to listen to the noise. Uh, this is uh, my request from my side. But other than that, if you want to keep showing your face to, to listen to the speakers, uh, it's also very good. Uh, Okay, so this is only announcement from my side. Uh, let me introduce Professor Tetsuo Morishita, a Vice President for Global Academic Affairs at Sofia University. Uh, Morishita Sensei, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Higashi Sensei. Uh, welcome to the symposium, uh, Challenges for Global Health Governance Under the Pandemic, uh, organized by the Sofia Institute of International Relations. Uh, representing Sofia University, I'd like to express my sincerest gratitude to Ms. Maria Espinosa for giving a keynote speech. It is a great honor and pleasure that Sofia University could welcome you as the keynote speaker of this very important event. Also, uh, I'd like to express my sincerest gratitude to Professor Takuma, Professor Deguchi, and Dr. Panzio uh, for being a commentator for this uh, symposium. I also want to express my heartfelt gratitude for the cooperation of the Sofia Institute of International Relations, Sofia Institute for Human Security, and Center for Global Education and Discovery at the host and co-host of this event. I'm really grateful for the cooperation of the Sofia University Alumni Association and Mr. Tori, the president of the association. Finally, I greatly appreciate all participants from various countries for joining this symposium. Sofia University has conducted Sofia United Nations Week twice a year. This symposium is the first event of the UN week, October 2021. I believe today's topic is crucial for our global society and is very appropriate as the first topic of the UN week held under the pandemic. I hope that today's symposium will provide you with an opportunity to think more deeply about the challenges in global health governance and how we could and should overcome various difficulties that a global society is facing. Thank you very much again, and please enjoy this symposium. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for great initial remarks, uh, Morishita Senses. So the next, I would like to ask Mr. Masao Tori, uh, president uh, of Sofia University Alumni Associations. Uh, uh, Mr. Tori, uh, President Tori, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Hina Sen and Morisho Sen for your kind words. Let me add my thanks to uh, today's speaker, keynote speaker, uh, Ms. Espinoza, on the timely topic of uh, uh, pandemic, how to, how to manage pandemic. Also, I'd like to thank the commentators, Takuma Sensei, Dengui Sensei, and Dr. Ponzio. Uh, COVID-19 has turned the world upside down, not to mention the loss of nearly 5 million lives, but also the uh, restrictions on the daily life. Uh, it has forced to new ways of uh, working and the communication uh, upon us. It has also widened the gap between the rich countries and poor countries, especially in particular to the uh, vaccine access. It is a pity that to vaccine distribution is seems to be driven by a political agenda. Uh, COVAX does not seem to be working as well as expected. Uh, it's reported only 1% of the African population has been vaccinated, only less than 1%. On the other hand, uh, I've been, uh, I had been in the farm industry for 50 years. So with the, uh, some uh, knowledge inside, we have seen advancement of uh, uh, technologies which has enabled the commercialization of uh, vaccines, also the uh, uh, treatments. This has been uh, amazing uh, technological advancement. Uh, the level of collaboration in the pharma industry is just uh, unprecedented, including the uh, sharing of technologies and molecules even. Uh, pharma giants are offering uh, support for manufacturing to alleviate the tight supply situation. I believe, uh, I hope I'm right, but we can be hopeful that we can reach, return to normalcy maybe early part of next year. What I hope is uh, the world has learned its lesson and is better prepared for the next uh, wave and crisis. So with that, I very much look forward to uh, today's lively discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Tori. Uh, yeah, this is very important fact that only 1% of the people in Africa was still vaccinate, was vaccinated. And uh, yeah, this is one of the things that we want to discuss today. So uh, yeah, I'm very honored to introduce uh, Ms. Maria Fernanda Espinosa Grasser, uh, who is a former president of the United Nations General Assemblies uh, from 2018 to 2019. Uh, she was also a former minister of foreign affairs in Ecuador. She's also a uh, defense minister of Ecuador. And she was also Ecuador ambassador to the United Nations. She, so she had uh, so much, so, so many experiences. And uh, as you know, she also was, uh, um, yeah, she's a very uh, famous uh, scholars uh, in Ecuador uh, on, the, on very, very different issues. And also she's a poet, poet, and she got the international award for his poem. So I don't know how many talent actually she has, but it's it's quite honor that when he Japanese government invited her to the Sofia University in 2018 as a president of UN General Assemblies, uh, we had a chance to host her seminars. Uh, let me share a little bit about our academic. Uh, this is an article in the website, but uh, yeah, Miss Maria came to the University of Sofia, uh, Sofia University in 2018, and I hosted her sessions, and uh, she really enjoyed that the discussion on the global issues, and uh, she even posted her Twitter tweet uh, together with her tweet with the Japanese foreign ministers and Japanese prime ministers. Uh, when she visited uh, to Japan in 2018. So that's the reason why I became very good. I, I, I come to know uh, Miss Maria Espinosa and uh, we requested or invited her to make some special lecture to make a seminar on this particular issue, which is a very impacting uh, people all over the world. So uh, we really appreciate uh, her commitment and time today. And uh, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, um, it, it's uh, really uh, such a pleasure uh, to be here with you once again uh, in Sofia University. And let me, of course, start by thanking Professor 
Daisako Higashi for making this possible and uh, to Sofia University and the respective institutes that have come together uh, today, the Institute of Foreign Relations, of Human Security, of Global Education for uh, this opportunity to address you today. And, and, and of course, my greetings to the audience and to the very distinguished scholars that are going to take part in the panel uh, today. Uh, greetings from Luxembourg uh, and uh, a, a cold and, and gray Luxembourg, but uh, with a warm soul because I am with you today. And uh, uh, I will start uh, straight you know, to the to the topic, uh, we all know that more than 19 months ago, uh, since uh, the outburst of the COVID pandemic, uh, the pandemic has proven to be a litmus test for the existing global governance system. Uh, it started as a global health crisis, and uh, but the the pandemic uh, turned uh, very rapidly into a systemic crisis. Uh, by deepening pre-existing inequalities and exposing vulnerabilities in, in our social, political, economic systems. Uh, in some, I would like to, to use this analytical category of the French sociologist uh, Marcel Mauss, uh, uh, calling uh, the pandemic a total social fact which means that it has had impacts in all areas of, of society uh, and uh, our economies. Uh, as it was mentioned before, uh, we have witnessed 230 million infections, approximately more than 4.7 million deaths, the worst economic crisis in nearly 100 years, and the first increase in global poverty in more than 20 years. Uh, let's just recall that in 2020, the pandemic caused a global economic contraction of 3.5%, the loss of 114 million jobs worldwide, and uh, pushed 97 million additional people into extreme poverty. So we it was uh, also uh, mentioned uh, by the president uh, of the uh, um, University Alumni uh, Association that the pandemic has um, disproportionately affected low-income countries and the most marginalized and impoverished people world worldwide. I, I think that a case in point here is uh, uh, that my own region, Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, the most unequal region in the world, perhaps presided by the Middle East, it has been uh, the region where uh, the, the, the pandemic has hit the hardest. Um, let's recall that uh, 45 million COVID-19 infections uh, in my region, almost 1.5 million deaths in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, basically, it's a middle-income region and it has 8% of the world's population, but it accounts for 31% of all infections and 20% of all deaths from COVID worldwide. So these are really not good news for Latin America. I think that uh, this tells us in a way that the pandemic has to be understood and addressed, not only as a health issue, but as a more complex phenomenon that um, derives from the interaction of both biological and social factors. And this interaction requires, of course, not only a, a broader understanding, but also a whole of society, whole of government uh, ex a responses and explanations. So uh, there is a shared understanding that to contain the, vir the virus, uh, what we need is stronger public health systems and universal health coverage. Um, in uh, on universal health coverage, I, I am uh, glad to say that one of the world leaders advocating for universal health coverage is Japan, uh, precisely. And what we need for that is to invest in robust social protection nets, in water and sanitation, in decent job opportunities, 
Um, so it is uh, an all-encompassing uh, approach. In sum, I think that the best way to prepare and increase our resilience to future, future pandemics is to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm happy uh, to hear that uh, this event is part of the UN Week that is uh, being organized by Sofia University. So, but, you know, however, truth be told, uh, when we needed cooperation and solidarity and a, a well-equipped -equi multilateral system to respond to the pandemic, we have an, uh, witnessed several uh, weaknesses and, and flaws of our international global governance system. And so it is in light of this context, which is not very promising, that I would like to, to basically uh, divide uh, my talk in, in three parts. One is what happened with the re response capacity of the multilateral system, the multilateral architecture. Uh, and um, what happened uh, with uh, the World Health Organization, um, how to improve uh, uh, the, the, the structure, the operational uh, system uh, of WHO, and, and also uh, what are the ideas, uh, the recommendations that uh, are being discussed uh, as we speak to uh, retool uh, the multilateral system to uh, boost the response capacity uh, of uh, our global governance architecture. So I think that we need to start by saying that the UN response to the pandemic um, had serious difficulties, especially at the beginning. The United Nations General Assembly met only several weeks after the pandemic was declared. The first UN General Assembly resolution on COVID-19 was adopted only in April 20, uh, several weeks after uh, the, the declaration, the formal declaration of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was declared 11th of March. The resolution of the General Assembly um, was uh, adopted on the 20th of, of, of April. And I think that at that time it was critical to ensure many things, uh, starting by uh, the working methods of the, of the UN under these particular circumstances, but also to ensure uh, uh, due attention on maintaining the supply chains for personal protective equipment, diagnostic supplies, other essential medical items that as we know collapsed uh, at the beginning of 2020. And the Security Council, the UN Security Council, was um, able to adopt a resolution only in July 2020, which is uh, almost three months later than the, uh, after the pandemic was declared. So, and uh, let's also uh, recall that only a few days ago, in October 7, the World Health Organization launched a global immunization plan. Uh, after almost uh, one year of the start of the vaccination efforts and of the invention of, of the, uh, the COVID-19 um, uh, vaccine. As it was already mentioned, we have uh, witnessed an, an equal access to the vaccines uh, due to basically uh, the difficulties in its manufacturing, but also in the deployment uh, worldwide, but um, I think that we have witnessed also international cooperation for vaccine rollout has been unsuccessful. Um, COVAX was mentioned, uh, COVAX uh, is a mechanism, uh, is a facility that was established uh, through a private public partnership, is a, is a platform uh, with a shared responsibility between WHO, the Vaccine Alliance, Gavi, and the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. And unfortunately, it has not worked uh, as expected. Uh, on the supply side of, of vaccine uh, uh, vaccines, especially to low-income countries, but also in the in deployment of vaccines at the national level. Uh, COVAX remains largely underfunded. Um, basically, 2.5 billion doses are needed only for 2021, 
And of that amount, only 13% uh, has uh, been delivered until uh, October, uh, October 7, uh, 2021. So uh, basically, uh, COVAX uh, slow ramp up has uh, had practical consequences. According to the recent UNDP data, industrialized countries have managed to vaccinate around roughly 60% of their population with at least one dose. Uh, and in low income countries, uh, this number only amounts to 3% in average. And as mentioned, um, Africa has uh, the lowest numbers of immunization. immunization. So the paradox is that uh, we know that in a pandemic uh, situation, no one is safe until everybody's safe. And however, uh, we have seen some countries uh, that have you know, uh, privileged the so-called national interest over solidarity and cooperation to secure human lives. Um, some countries have favored unilateral measures such as closure of borders, vaccine hoarding, prohibition of exports of medical supplies, insufficient support for the economic recovery of low-income countries, uh, which, uh, as we know, uh, we have seen uh, the developing countries um, uh, experience, um, you know, fiscal revenues uh, uh, decreasing and their levels or of an external indebtedness uh, also uh, dramatically increase. And um, I, I think that we also have to say that during the course of 2020, uh, the United Nations established a series of funds and mechanisms to support the developing countries. Uh, they requested $13 billion uh, to address the health, the humanitarian, the socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic uh, through, um, as mentioned, several mechanisms, the global humanitarian response plan to, to COVID, the COVID-19 response and recovery fund, the WHO strategic preparedness and response plan, et cetera, a series of plans uh, of $13 billion. And, and basically, only 4 billion were collected until the end of 2020, uh, leaving a, a, a financing gap of about $9 billion. So we see that we, we truly lacked solidarity, we truly lacked uh, concerted action. So basically what to do, uh, what to do? I don't think that we should think that uh, uh, it is a manifest destiny no, not to be able to, to respond to the current pandemic and its uh, um, impacts in our economies and societies. So there are several think tanks, groups, uh, mechanisms discussing how to improve our international uh, governance systems. And, and I think that um, how, how to do it. Um, and I am uh, proud to say, very honored to be part of the COVID-19 Lancet Commission. Uh, we have published a series of statements, position papers uh, in response to the pandemic. We are currently working on a set of recommendations precisely to improve public health governance and boost uh, global health cooperation. And, and we are experiencing the good news in, in this bleak picture is that we are, I see, experiencing a global awakening, uh, um, you know, about the need to, to retool, to revitalize the United Nations. And this process uh, started, uh, kicked off in 2020. Uh, with the occasion, um, no, I, I would say not 2020, 2019, I would say uh, with uh, the occasion of the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the crea creation of the United Nations. And, and I think that this moment of reinvention provides a unique opportunity for advancing serious reforms uh, in the multilateral system and uh, better equip the existing architecture to, ad uh, to address the, uh, the challenges that uh, we, we face. And there, there is a list, uh, a, a long menu of alternatives. And I would like to only briefly mention some recommendations uh, that are now being discussed uh, in different fora. Um, 
And basically what is the purpose is to improve uh, the prevention preparedness capacity to face the current, but also the future pandemics. Uh, I will uh, in, in now look at the UN as an organization, as an ecosystem. I would focus specifically on WHO and, and some discussions on reform of WHO. And uh, I would just end by mentioning briefly because of time constraints, uh, two very novel initiatives that are being discussed as we speak. So in terms of uh, reforms for the United Nations, I think that it is obvious that in situations uh, like a, a global pandemic, the UN has to play a central role uh, in global public health, and in particular in emergencies uh, that uh, in, in, in we see that we need to retool the, the system that we already have uh, as it is now. So one of the issues is the budget of the United Nations. The UN regular budget for 2021, for example, is uh, around $3.2 billion. And this number uh, is 5% higher than the budget of 2020, but it is still largely insufficient to address the current and future challenges that the world faces. Uh, this amount of money, of course, uh, it's supposed to do everything to support countries to implement the sustainable development goals, to deal with peace and security issues, to deal with human rights, the entire UN agenda programs and agencies uh, have uh, basically to perform with $3.2 billion, which sometimes is a, a budget um, smaller than a, a medium-sized company. And, and I think that uh, truly to be more effective, the UN requires a better balance between what we call uh, regular contributions, the contributions paid by, by member states, and earmarked contributions, uh, especially the money that the UN receives for very specific thematic uh, activities. And that, that we need a better balance between regular budget and earmark, uh, earmark contributions, uh, as, as I mentioned. Um, basically, uh, only if you ha we have a predictable core budget, uh, the United Nations under the guidance of member states can determine and set and set up priorities and adequately address the needs of the most vulnerable. Uh, that, that is the, 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 the main responsibility of the United Nations. On the other hand, I think that uh, the humanitarian impact of the COVID crisis in, in refugee camps, in areas of conflict, um, uh, in uh, the, the, the suffering and the stress uh, uh, for lack of liquidity and, and increased uh, debt in developing countries, basically called for a coordination mechanism between the UN and the international financial institutions, the IMF, the regional banks, uh, the World Bank. And, and this, in, inter, this uh, coordination mechanism can be activated in situations of global emergencies. And this basically to swiftly provide relief uh, assistance to countries that are in need. Uh, this mechanism could take the form of a global fund for health emergencies as suggested by the United States. And this would help to mitigate uh, and uh, recover, uh, especially, especially as mentioned for low and middle income countries. And basically, and just to close, I think it's important that in situations of crisis, the UN uh, makes full use of its powers. Uh, for example, under the authority of the General Assembly, uh, I, I basically some are calling for to establish a committee of the whole, including all main UN bodies and agencies to address non-military global crises, like the, the, the health crisis that we are experiencing. Uh, this committee of the whole that will bring together ECOSOC and the Security Council and the General Assembly, plus UN programs and agencies would serve to, uh, and, and of course the multilateral banks uh, to basically um, um, respond uh, as, a, as a one system, as a one uh, UN 
uh, to deliver in a coordinated concert, concerted uh, manner. And there are other uh, ideas that are out there. I will just end by mentioning two at the end, but let's go into uh, potential reforms of the World Health Organization. We have to recall that this November, next month, the World Health Assembly is meeting again, and it's going to consider basically two, two very important issues, uh, the reform of WHO and the development of uh, this new uh, treaty on pandemics that is uh, in the making. We all agree, and I, I think it has uh, its uh, uh, it's uh, a common denominator among countries, among societies, uh, that WHO uh, should be the authoritative source of health information and provide guidance, protocols, universal standards in situations of uh, health emergencies. Uh, in this way, I think that the political, the economic, the policy decisions uh, should be based on authoritative health information from independent scientists. And the overseeing uh, the, the, the um, choreography has to be organized from WHO. And I think that preventing a crisis and responding quickly to an emergency requires uh, for sure, and we learn because of COVID, the harmonization on standards, on protocols, on approval by national and regional regulatory bodies for ensuring, for example, vital medical equipment, diagnostic, diagnostics, treatments, scientific information. And, and to this end, WHO must have uh, um, you know, a, a strong and centralized standardized international uh, regulatory mechanisms, uh, as mentioned in times of health crisis. These, uh, these uh, centralized mechanism could be considered as part of the uh, uh, proposed uh, treaty on pandemics. And this would be perhaps the only way to support governments to ensuring that their national regulatory agencies, their, their national CDCs, their centers for disease control and the, and the regional bodies operate in a coordinated manner. And, and I think that WHO should be empowered to take a leading, convening and coordinating uh, role in operational aspects of, emerg of health uh, emergencies uh, as well. Um, and I think towards this end, it should develop uh, basically, some are suggesting the need uh, to establish a new disease surveillance and alert system. Uh, under the uh, authority of WHO, which we don't have, the world doesn't have. So uh, basically, uh, some experts are also proposing the establishment of an internationally uh, international emergency health regulatory agency, uh, in, in basically formed by independent scientists that would be entrusted to produce the protocols, the guidance, the approval criteria uh, for use uh, by national and, and regional authorities. And the WHO should exercise oversight of global health emergency situations. This, I think, is extremely, extremely important. So I think that there is agreement that we need uh, to strengthen the role, uh, the authority of, of WHO, the budget of WHO, and there are decisions that have to be made uh, by uh, member states, of course, and uh, we, we have to see and follow closely what happens uh, with uh, the process of uh, of um, of crafting and adopting this new uh, treaty on on pandemics. The other uh, uh, very important lessons that we have learned with COVID is the need to recognize public health as a global public good, and what does it, it means that um, it, we need to recognize health as a human right uh, and public health as a global public good. And it, this is important because it allows, uh, it is uh, the, the vehicle, the avenue to ensure a universal access to health and uh, um, access to health and human lives, uh, taking primacy over profit and self-interest. So I think that's absolutely critical 
to be better prepared for future pandemics. I think that this fundamental step will guide countries to increase their own investments in public health systems and ensure universal health coverage before 2030. This uh, ensuring universal health coverage before 2030 uh, will allow us to achieve sustainable development goal number three on global health. And I think it's critical in 2023, we are organizing a high level meeting on universal health coverage. And I, I hope that in 2023, we, will, we would be you know, in a much better position than we are today. So I think that uh, recognizing um, um, uh, health uh, as, a, as a global public good um, is also a, a way to, to recognize um, the need uh, for rethinking the current intellectual property, property rights regime, uh, especially when you are in an emergency, especially when you need to ensure uh, enough manufacturing capacity for vaccines and other fundamental technologies uh, to prevent and eradicate pandemic threats. Uh, so um, this is also a very important part of reforming the global governance uh, uh, for uh, pandemic and global health emergencies. Um, we uh, agree in, in that the current intellectual property rights regime has deepened the technological dependence of developing countries and, uh, and has led uh, to, you know, to millions of lives uh, lost due to the restriction, uh, to restrictions to broaden the production capacity of developing countries uh, to make their own vaccines and medicines. So I think that this is also a critical uh, governance question that we need uh, to seriously uh, tackle. And uh, perhaps to end in this set of, uh, this menu of, of new ideas, um, basically there, is, uh, uh, there are several voices uh, from different parts of the world calling for the creation of a mechanism within the United Nations to address non-military threats to human security. And uh, such a mechanism should not be only in charge of responding to pandemics as suggested by uh, a uh, the report of independent panel on pandemic preparedness and response um, that was established because of COVID-19, uh, but uh, it should uh, encompass uh, uh, include uh, the coordination of other global crises, such as the extinction crisis, the loss of biodiversity, environmental degradation and pollution, massive force displacement, food insecurity, and other cross-cutting international crises that are beyond the mandate of the UN Security Council. This is one of the issues that is being discussed um, um, as, as, as we speak. So I think that COVID-19 pandemic is a good example of, of the type uh, the, and nature of the crisis that the world will unfortunately increasingly face in the 21st century. Uh, it cuts not only across national borders, but also across traditional subject areas. It is a health crisis, but it's also a financial crisis, a trade crisis, an education crisis, and a poverty and inequality crisis altogether. Um, and this is uh, very much uh, the shape and, and, and depth of uh, many of the emergent, uh, emergent issues of our time, including climate change, migrant and refugee movements, food insecurity, etc. So basically here the message is that these multiple crises transcend the scope of the UN Security Council, but are no less uh, threatening to human security than the ones that do. They're, they're armed conflict related, of course. So um, uh, there is, um, along these lines, there is a proposal uh, that is currently being discussed about the establishment of a UN Global Resilience Council with the authority to enact a large scale collective response uh, to non-military crisis. And, and I think that this idea deserves uh, further thinking 
and, and further a global conversation. And basically, uh, we, we have witnessed since uh, the UN General Assembly, since last month in September, there was the launching of the UN Secretary General report called Our Common Agenda, a launch on September 10th of this year. Perhaps uh, Richard Poncio can share a, a little more in detail what the Common Agenda contains, but it basically, this report calls uh, countries to vaccinate 70% of the population by the second quarter of 2022, uh, meaning that that would be perhaps uh, the threshold uh, to really phase out the current pandemic. And responding to this call of our common agenda, the 7th of October, as mentioned, the WHO launched the global vaccination strategy with 40% of world population vaccinated by the end of this year of 2021, in order to reach the 70% by mid 2022. And basically this vaccination effort uh, requires doubling vaccine production and ensuring equitable distribution. And that of course requires uh, money, in, uh, in, it requires financing for production and deployment. And of course, it requires supporting developing country in, uh, countries in implementing immunization programs. Uh, so uh, that's one of the, of the issues addressed in our common uh, agenda, but also a very clear call to empower and strengthen the authority and the resources of WHO. So there are uh, excellent ideas contained in our common agenda, which I invite you to, to read, including something that I feel it's, um, has a great potential. Uh, the report calls uh, on countries to present universal health universal periodic review processes to promote cooperation, but also accountability uh, from countries. It also recommends the creation of an emergency platform, uh, which would be a sort of this global resilience council that we discussed, but not as a permanent body, but uh, as one that would only be activated in cases of, of, of health emergencies and, and, and crisis. What we heard, and let me now uh, just uh, start uh, wrapping up uh, because I think that my, my time is, is, is up, but uh, I would say that what we witnessed during the last uh, high level debate of the General Assembly is a, a common narrative, a shared narrative that our multilateral system need to be, needs to be retooled rejuvenated, improved to respond to our current realities, to the current threats, to the crisis that we're, the multiple crises that we are experiencing. And I think that we have to take uh, this, um, this opportunity, this political will that we are witnessing. So in spite of the current challenges uh, faced by our multilateral system, political will and the need for reform is gaining traction. And we have to use the opportunity. There is raising awareness uh, of the need to, to, to have uh, uh, stronger public health systems. There is also renewed consensus that nationalism and unilateralism are counterproductive and that our well-being increasingly depends on the ability of our multilateral mechanisms to facilitate effective collective action. Uh, I think that um, the steps that we have witnessed in recent, recent months uh, to strengthen our prevention and response and resilience capacity um, is, uh, you know, I would say uh, that these initiatives are, are still incipient, uh, but are important and positive uh, steps. And from our respective places, academia, universities, civil society, social movements, the private sector, we, have co uh, we are co-responsible. We have the duty to hold our leaders, the decision makers accountable for uh, the delivery of their commitments uh, to combat the pandemic, but also to promote an inclusive, sustainable, and resilient recovery. So I have no doubt that we are living times of transformation. 
And we have, uh, just uh, to repeat that, to grab, to take the opportunity to build forward better. Uh, and uh, by that, I mean uh, to build more equal, sustainable, peaceful, and resilient societies. We all have uh, a role to play. I would like to now uh, thank you for your kind attention and, um, and just uh, return the floor to our moderator, Professor Higashi Daisaku. Thank you again for your patience. No, thank you very much. Uh, wonderful, wonderful lectures and very inspiring and also hopeful presentations. And I, I, I want to emphasize uh, what he, he, he mentioned in terms of the nature of the pandemics. Uh, he mentioned that until everybody becomes safe, nobody will be safe, right? And this is a kind of a concept that many experts on pandemic continue to emphasize in the last one and, two and a half years. But it may not be so familiar for many students. So if I explain a little bit, you know, we have so many, so many mutations, right? Or new vibrant from those kind of virus. So even though one country might contain the pandemic by vaccinations or by very strict health uh, regulations, as long as you have an expansion of the pandemic or corona pandemics in the world, especially in the developing countries, they might create a lot of mutations and new vibrant, and they will attack even the developed countries again. And we witness those kind of a cycle again and again, right? In the last one and a half years. So, so that's the reason why we believe that it's so crucial to vaccinate people all over the world so that everybody becomes safe because what? Well, because everybody becomes safe, everybody becomes safe. <laughs> so, yeah. So and, until everybody becomes safe, nobody will be safe. So this is a very, I think, important concept. And the, the question is how to make it possible. So thank you very much again. And I'd like to ask uh, Professor Takuma to make a comment. I, I will ask a three commentator to make a comment for maybe five to seven minutes or eight minutes, and the, then I will ask the floor to start asking the questions to both panelists and also Maria, so that we can have a kind of global, active global conversations. I'm very honored to introduce Kayo Takuma, a professor in Tokyo Metropolitan University. As you know, she's a leading scholar on global health issues, and uh, so we continue to see her in many, many TV programs or newspapers, and she's extremely busy, but uh, yeah, I sincerely appreciate that she decided to take a time was to share high ideas and, and, and maybe some recommendation on this particular issue. So Takuma Sensei, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you for introducing uh, Professor Higashi. Uh, I'm Kayo Takuma from Tokyo Metropolitan University. Uh, first, I'd like to express my deepest appreciation for everyone who organized and prepared for this uh, webinar. Uh, it's great honor for me to attend this, uh, uh, this webinar as a commentator. Thank you for having me and thank you for this precious opportunity. And thank you for uh, Ms. Espinoza for giving a, a fantastic and inspiring speech. I'm researching the global health governance uh, with a special interest in its interaction with the world politics. And from such a perspective, I would like to make some comments. So let me share my PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah, so let me make you co-host. So now I think you can share. Yes, yes. thank you very yeah. much. So, Um, as uh, Ms. Espinoza explained, the, the COVID-19 pandemic is not just a um, public health emergency, but is a more complex, complex phenomenon, which is closely linked to various social factors. Its remarkable feature is that, unlike other recent outbreaks such as Ebola or MERS, uh, it simultaneously spread worldwide. 
as the number of uh, victim countries was uh, limited in the cases of Ebola or avian flu, resources such as medical equipment or medicines are made, made available uh, quite easily by countries not impacted by them. By contrast, almost all, all countries became victims of the COVID-19, and they have, been, they have been scrambling for access to uh, vaccines, uh, medical equipment, and medicines. As a result, the gap between the haves and have-nots is, grow, is in, increasing as, uh, as, you know, that, as this chart uh, shows. The the situation regarding the vaccine access, vaccine ac access is extraordinary, as it as it is estimated that by the end of this year, rich countries will have 1.2 billion uh, surplus vaccine doses, while only around uh, 3%, uh, 1 to 3% of African population is fully vaccinated at present. The efforts of the COVAX facility as the first ever framework for equitable supply is admirable since it co-finances and provides safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines mainly to the low and middle income countries. Despite such efforts, uh, however, the reality is the prevalence of my country first and my country first policy, and there is a big access gap between the developed and the developing countries. The... Under such circumstances, every country and region is attempting to strengthen its preparedness and uh, response capacity. The European Health Euro European Union, uh, which has been uh, quite reluctant to uh, reluctant about uh, integration in the field of health, has moved forward uh, since uh, since last autumn to establish the European Health Union, wherein uh, wherein the member countries can share information and cooperate in other aspects. The African Union has also strengthened its uh, strengthened its regional health cooperation system. In addition, China and Russia uh, have helped some developing countries manufacture vaccines by their own. For example, Sinovac's vaccines are being produced in Egypt in, uh, since this summer. On the other hand, the Quad groups comprising Australia, India, Japan, and the United States announced their uh, vac vaccine partnership under which, under which the four countries plan to increase uh, the production and distribution of vaccines to Southeast Asia and other countries. And uh, countries also moving forward at the national level to strengthen their uh, preparedness and response capacity. Just last week, the newly elected Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida uh, announced in his keynote speech uh, his intention to strengthen the incident command system for pandemic preparedness in Japan. Thus, the most country and regions have realized how, how unreliable the global health governance system is, especially during a crisis. They are therefore attempting to strengthen pandemic preparedness and response at national and regional level, while the reform of the governance on a global level is ongoing. As a result, there is some possibility that the post-COVID-19 uh, post global health governance system will be more fragile and uh, devoid of leadership. Even the negotiation for establishing a new pandemic treaty, which to which uh, uh, Ms. Espinoza mentioned, uh, not proceeding smoothly, largely because of the discord among the, the WHO's member countries. So uh, based on this situation, I would like to uh, raise uh, two questions. First, uh, I'm wondering if some comprehensive measures such as a one UN approach will function smoothly, while I believe such a, such a uh, comprehensive system is necessary for coping with the future uh, pandemic. I mean that uh, under uh, such a comprehensive system, there will arise some overlap or uh, you know, competition among uh, actors, related actors. I'm also wondering whether the, w the WHO will keep its central position under such a comprehensive system. 
And secondly, I'm wondering whether the world can agree on reforms of the global health architecture. Political support and agreement is indispensable for conducting reforms in global health architecture. However, looking at the current political uh, situation, which is full of discord and divide, uh, I cannot but wondering if nations can unite uh, for change. Uh, uh, my perspective is quite pessimistic and uh, realistic, but uh, uh, I, I would appreciate if I could, uh, it could lead to the future discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Takuma Sensei, for your you know and a very great guidance for the for the kind of COVAX and another UN system to address this global pandemics. And also, I really appreciate your frank questions about challenge or making that kind of comprehensive system because, you know, we we might be might living in the divided world between especially between the China and the United States, which are for which are leading the you know global government right now so yeah this is very important and the critical question so thank you very much uh, we are looking forward to having a discussion on this so let me appoint professor deguchi uh makiko deguchi professor makiko deguchi is a director at the center for global education discovery which i also belong so we are working together for many uh, projects together and uh, uh deguchi sensei is also leading scala on the gender issue in, in japan so yeah, I'm looking forward to your, your comment uh, on this particular issue. Thank you very much, Tegu Sensei. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Higashi. And thank you, um, Ms. Espinoza, uh, for your extremely um, you know, overarching and um, also inspiring uh, talk. Uh, my area of specialty is um, uh, psychology, um, actually. And so I'm used to dealing with people, you know, uh, the process of change within the individual. So this kind of you know very global kind of um, area is I feel a, a much a, a novice, <laughs> and so I'm a little bit overwhelmed. However, um, I I really was inspired. I you know I mean I guess I'm an optimist in that I you know I I wish and I hope that countries learn from this experience, you know of this uh, of of doing the you know my nation first approach and then and then realizing you know because of that perhaps. You know, we are in a very prolonged pandemic. You know, if we had acted sooner, uh, we could have, you know, you know, perhaps ended this much quickly. Um, and especially, you know, having followed the news in the United States, for example, um, you know, even the United States, it became, you know, each state out for its own, you know, safety. So that e even each state was was working independently, and it was a complete chaos. So I, I do hope that, you know, we learn from this, that, you know, we really need to act with a strong centralized leadership. And so, um, you know, your comment about the UN and the w, you know, the World Health Organization taking a much centralized role, you know, seem to be, you know, of course, um, I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, uh, you know, as you said, gaining traction, um, you know, in the, in the world stage. And one of the things that you mentioned that I was also, um, uh, you know, quite uh, inspired by and agreeing was the recognition um, of public health as a global public good. And, and I think one of the barriers to that seems to be this um, issue with the private sector, you know, namely the, um, the pharmaceutical uh, companies who, you know, uh, and I think that, you know, because COVAX is an organization that is funded, you know, by private, both private and public organization. I think there's, you know, we're also contending. There's always a tension there, right? Where I think that the private organization says, well, you know, we need to protect the intellectual property rights because, um, you know, where's the incentive? You know, where's the incentive for innovation? And so I was really curious, um, you know, you know, how do you sort of, you know, balance that question? Yeah. You know, and so if you can maybe uh, talk to that, address that, uh, I would really appreciate it. So I think I'll end my comments and question here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think this is very one of the key questions or issues about how to address pandemics in all over the world, because we have a patent for intellectual right, and this intellectual right is certainly the motivation for the many pharmacy companies to develop the medicines. 
but at the same time, it could be the big blockade or this, you know, block for the for 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 the corona corona vaccination to be distributed to the all over the world. So yeah, this is this is one of the very important questions, and I really appreciate uh, the sharing uh, your thought. Okay, so um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Richard Ponzio, for waiting for us. Uh, he, Richard Ponzio is the director and the global governance, justice, and security program in the Stimson Center at Washington, D.C. Uh, he, I think he's originally a specialist on the post-conflict peace building that I shared <laughs> with him, but he also has a, you know, numerous projects uh, running in terms of the global issues, and that we I we really have a huge respect uh, for for his for, for his comprehensive understanding and also commanding so many projects uh, at the same time. So we are very happy to have him to give us some key key thoughts uh, uh, on these issues from the New York or Washington D.C. Uh, even though it, this session starts from seven, seven o'clock your time. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you once again, Professor Gashi, uh, organizers of this important discussion at Sophia Daigaku, and um, my old friend, uh, Her Excellency Miss uh, Maria Fernanda Espinoza. So great to hear uh, the overview kickoff remarks on today's uh, discussion about global health governance. I'd like to make three brief uh, points in response to key issues raised by Miss Espinoza. Uh, first, I um, fully subscribe to her first core claim that the pandemic must not be understood solely as a health issue, but a much broader phenomena. She refers to different uh, social and biological factors, and, and this really very much inform the recommendations that she puts forward, which go well beyond simple technocratic health uh, responses. Um, in our own report uh, brought out uh, just a few weeks ago for the annual high-level UN General Assembly um, High Level Week, uh, we put forward, it, it's uh, in the chat box there, as well as the Our Common Agenda report that Ms. Espinoza referred to, uh, uh, the new Secretary General Initiative that I'm sure we'll be discussing because it gets at some of these broader themes. The theme, the title of our report was Building Back Together and Greener. And so it very much connects um, the need for uh, adorable, green, but uh, especially broad-based recovery plan, not just the immediate humanitarian response and getting shots into arms and the vaccination campaign, which is absolutely critical, but start to think now about broader issues of recovery uh, and, and linking it to um, uh, the COP26, the climate action agenda that's going to be very much discussed globally in the next few weeks when the meeting is held in Glasgow in early November. But as you'll see, and, I, and I'll say a few words in a minute with a few PowerPoint slides, so be ready for that, Higashi-san, uh, uh, about four dimensions of recovery and all the different diverse governmental, but also especially non-governmental actors that need to be involved. Now, uh, Ms. Espinoza's critique couldn't be more uh, prescient of what happened, especially in 2020, the failures, the gaps, we're gonna be learning lessons for years, three in particular, that I thought were most helpful, the politicization of the WHO. We've heard again and again uh, about how China withholding critical information for the WHO to understand the origins of the pandemic. But let's not forget in my own country, the United States, uh, the previous administration under President Trump uh, threatening, initiating a process of withdrawing from the WHO and critical financial and other support to the WHO in the middle of a pandemic, no less. And this uh, tension that Higashi-san refers to of the US-China struggle, it also is of course played out in the Security Council, which has a role in health security as Ms. Espinoza referred to. There was uh, a call by the Secretary General, Mr. Guterres, to have a global ceasefire, especially in fragile conflict affected states that needed critical assistance uh, during uh, the start of the pandemic and uh, that it took four or five months before the members of the Security Council would agree to that just basic step, uh, a pra practical step in the midst of this crisis. The third though, and most important, and, 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 and Ms. Espinoza refers to elements of it, I'd like to add in addition that the General Assembly, which she led in the 73rd session prior to the pandemic, 
but it took uh, 10 months after the WHO declares a public health emergency of international concern. That was in early 2020. It wasn't until December that there was the first ever high level meeting of the General Assembly to respond to the pandemic. And even then they could not res uh, uh, conclude with a consensus statement or new financing for those under resourced trust funds that Ms. Espinoza referred to. So in our own analysis, uh, my colleagues and I concluded that the system, uh, especially last year, we're already making many improvements, but it has been fragmented, fragmented, delayed, ad hoc, and, and especially under-resourced. A third uh, reflection, and, and that has to do with the whole range of interesting proposals uh, to improve the system that Ms. Espinoza referred to, um, both for uh, prevention and, and better response to future health crises, but, but even going beyond, and that's where her reference initially to a whole of committee proposal, as Ms. Espinoza asked me to say a few words about our common agenda, the Secretary General really refers to not just the UN proper, all those programs, funds, and agencies, but working closer with the international financial institutions, the World Bank, the uh, IMF, uh, regional development banks. Um, th these ideas are likely to play out the next few years on a whole range of recovery, the broader recovery agenda, which I'm going to speak to in a second. Uh, the G20 is something that's uh, been central in our own research at uh, the Stimson Center. And the, later this month will be another G20 meeting in Rome. They will speak to not just the health crisis, but the broader recovery themes. The Global Resilience Council, highly recommend looking into that, uh, that Ms. Espinoza referred to. But I think it's those three proposals from the International Panel on Pandemic Preparedness and Response that are absolutely most critical to this discussion, the Health Security Council idea, the new legal instrument that she referred to, the Pandemic Framework Convention, and then uh, something of a technical nature, but it, it's uh, there's also politics involved, a more independent World Health Organization, better funded, and um, you know just better capabilities to respond quickly. The WHO clearly needs to be on the front lines. So let me conclude my brief overview remarks with a, just a few slides from our recent report that I referred to earlier and you can find in the chat box as well as the Our Common Agenda report. Here is the, uh, the title slide on what we focused on, but it is really these whole range of actors, many of which have been referred to in today's conversation. Uh, they're in the center of the slide. Uh, Gavi and COVAX facility, maybe we can discuss further because they're truly uh, multi-stakeholder interdisciplinary instruments that involve, you see the business sector in the far left, the, the pharmaceutical industry, you see influencers in our own country, very famous as Dr. Anthony Fauci, a famous scientist, uh, uh, the Gates Foundation in, among the civil society organizations, uh, uh, really a leader in global health uh, issues and, and WHO that we keep referring to among uh, intergovernmental bodies. These are critical, but there's an equally large galaxy of organizations that will be involved in the broader recovery, a green recovery. And here we refer to four different dimensions. Certainly the health dimension is critical and, and we, in that third point there, but we give particular attention to the most vulnerable refugees, internally displaced, disabled, in some countries, women and youth are still uh, deeply uh, threatened and, and underprivileged. Um, the, um, the green agenda, climate adaptation and mitigation, that's the first point. And don't forget issues of uh, jobs and fairness workers. The, the informal economy has often been the most upended and, and, and dislocated during uh, the last 18 months. That's the second point. And, and, and everybody thinks on the fourth point of a digital cooperation, oh, these uh, technological solutions are going to save the world. Yes, they, they have many promising contributions, but there is immense uh, waste associated just with the hardware of our uh, digital system that we're not able to recycle. And secondly, uh, things like the Bitcoin and blockchain, the immense emissions that are created from these new technologies is something worth looking very closely at. I won't have time to get into our different proposal ideas, but needless to say, the, the national re, uh, COVID response plans are now morphing into broader uh, green recovery initiatives. They're actually synced up with something I think many are familiar with in this conversation, uh, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the, the 17 SDGs. This third idea is within our category of health 
and, and, and dealing with the most vulnerable, a global fund for social protection. Let me just note that it would um, achieve four things, boosting coordination efforts for establishing social protection floors, uh, strengthen low income countries ability to mobilize domestic resources, address the funding gap for social protection floors in low income countries, and provide risk insurance for those economies that are highly vulnerable to shocks. I'm so glad that Ms. Espinoza mentioned that the, the, the leadership role Japan plays on promoting uh, universal health coverage. We need to extend that debate to deal with all uh, issues around social, social safety nets, especially for the poor and most vulnerable. Let me finish with this slide, which uh, <laughs> is a very busy one. It talks about many activities uh, of an intergovernmental nature. That's the top part of the slide. The bottom are um, actual proposed ideas uh, that civil society, uh, academics, journalists, the private sector can organize around on a road to a, a, a green recovery plan, something that could culminate in a discussion in New York, since the world leaders come together uh, every year this year. No surprise, uh, in, in the last few weeks, COVID was the number one issue and, and uh, the uh, climate agenda coming up with Glasgow was the second leading one. We need to continue that discussion and uh, bring together these powerful bodies like the G20 and the World Bank, the IMF, who are putting billions of dollars into recovery programs and discuss them at uh, the General Assembly next year. But there's a number of steps leading up to it. Uh, the annual meeting of the bank, the World Bank and the IMF that meets in here in Washington, D.C. every April. They can get into the core financing issues because they bring together the world's uh, leading finance ministers, including from your own country of Japan, for many on this call. So let me uh, wrap up there and just say that, you know, financing is not the issue. Your country of Japan, my country, the United States, uh, the European Union, trillions of dollars. We're talking just monumental sums. What's needed now is, um, you know, an awareness, this key theme today that we're not going to solve this crisis until we solve it. It's a truly uh, global collective action problem, something that uh, is often studied in our um, academic courses, the need for a global public goods response. And uh, therefore, we need to get beyond focusing inwardly and only on our own populations. If we're really going to address this crisis, we have to go global and it has a lot to do with the governing system. So besides, you know, dealing with the emergency at hand, let's start to think big about building a system for better prevention and response for future crises. And that's what our own thinking at the Stimson Center, but the uh, Our Common Agenda report that Ms. Espinosa referred to, this will help create a roadmap for a more sustainable and just future. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Yeah, very, very comprehensive and uh, very great, uh, great uh, recommendations and, uh, and the proposals. Build back together greener is uh, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm sure that there are many students and uh, young people and, uh, and, uh, and, and the participants who want to ask questions. I'm sorry to get you wait for long. So let me collect two or three questions from the in a, in a, in a participant. And then I will get back to the you know, Maria to respond to those questions, but as well as a, uh, some questions raised by the another commentator. So uh, if you want to ask question, please uh, raise your hand by putting the reaction icon. You can raise your hand and then please mention your name, uh, affiliations, and uh, hopefully the country that you participate because it's very interesting to see uh, that the people participate from all over the world. Yeah. So could you raise your hand uh, for the person who can want to ask question? Uh, I'm not so capable, so I cannot see chat when I moderate and also I need to listen to the presentation. So please raise your hand when you have a question. Yeah. Okay, Pooja Ambusam. Ah, to... Hello, sir. Yes, it's Pooja. Um... My question is for- Ms. Can I ask you where you're from? Oh, yes. Uh, I'm Pooja Anbu from India. I'm an undergraduate student majoring in psychology, sociology, and economics. So my question is for Mrs. Espionsa. Um, 
in your uh, part, you mentioned that human needs to play a central role given uh, issues like global health, right? But uh, given political nuances, UN does lack real executive power in its member states, right? So how much of an impact can we expect such an organization to have? Okay, thank you very much. The very quick and very precise. So yeah, please uh, conclude the question hopefully by one minute because I want to get the many questions as many as possible. So Arbata Lee-san, Hi, hello, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Aspinsola for the excellent presentation and also other speaker. I'm from Hong Kong. I'm a professor in public health and primary care. Oh, thank you and I try to make it very short. I think the impact of COVID is really beyond just the direct health effect of COVID, it also jeopardized the care of other conditions like rehabilitation, on communicable disease, preventive service, and because the service being interrupted and suspended, and also the health impact, all right, and also beyond the health sector, for example, it affects education and also social service and social mobility, which have a detrimental effect on the social determinants of health. And I just like to, uh, Mrs. Espinosa and Mother Speaker, enlighten us how we could face a challenge during the recovery phases to tackling some other indirect issue related to COVID, which has a strong detrimental effect. And also talking about the governance reform the healthcare system. How about a more solid plan to strengthen the primary healthcare system to ensure the universal coverage to a broader range of services? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lee. So let me get one more question. Uh, Kentaro Kamaga-san? Yes. Um, uh, uh, my name is Kentaro Kamaga. I'm from Japan, Kumamoto, uh, Kumamoto Prefecture, which Thank is very much. famous for the good nature. So I have some, I have a question. Um, the corona pandemic, uh, uh, the, one well, turning point that we uh, we, uh, we were aware of the importance of the <clears throat> improving the um, uh, society system, and the uh, Japan have very trouble with some uh, trouble of uh, uh, healthcare system or uh, economic uh, stop of economic growth. But I think that economic growth and the healthcare system, uh, good healthcare is a bit contradicted because uh, if we promote like going out and shopping, and this this connect to the pan. Uh, um, unfortunately, maybe the pandemic or pand more worse pandemic. Uh, but if we shut down, like uh, shut down the city, maybe if uh, maybe it is good for the healthcare, but uh, it's down the uh, quality of the economy. So what, sh what is the best way to make a balance of economy and healthcare? Thank you very much. That's, that's very dilemma that we are facing all, you know, all over the world. So thank you so much for your great question from the Kumamoto Prefecture. So Maria-san, I can, not <laughs> Miss Maria, uh, can I give you maybe about three to five minutes to respond to the question that you get? Can you make a, a, a mute? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that is a challenge because the questions have been uh, uh, very, very interesting yep. and, uh, and they deserve, uh, you know, uh, comprehensive and broad answers. But I would like to, you know, I, I think I, I, I am going to try and be telegraphic uh, here <laughs> yeah. in, in, in a way um, regarding why we are putting so much effort in, in making the UN fit for purpose, why the UN is so important. And the question about the executive powers uh, of, of the UN, um, basically uh, international law, all, all the normative uh, work, the policy guidance uh, comes from the UN and uh, UN specialized uh, programs and agencies. It's, it's extremely important. But the UN is not a self-governing body. It's, it's not an entity that it's independent. It really very much reflects what member states want the UN to do and deliver. And it, it is extremely important that we take seriously 
uh, the trust deficit in general, in institutions, uh, in, in general, in, in politics and political parties worldwide. If you look at uh, the Edelman Trust Barometer, you see that there is a problem of, of trust in institutions. And I think that's uh, critical. And when we, we speak about the need to reform and retool the UN and improve uh, its uh, response capacity, it is an extremely serious uh, issue. And, and of course, uh, one of the panelists mentioned, uh, but we live in a very polarized, fragmented world. How is that we're going to get our act together and agree on a, on a profound, meaningful reform for the UN? I think it is a matter of survival. First of all, because in this particular case, literally human lives uh, are at stake. Uh, human lives, but also economic recovery. Um, and, and, and I think that there is agreement that we need to upgrade the UN. Uh, it's absolutely critical because it is uh, like when you have a philharmonic, an orchestra, you need something to get organized and to lead uh, the choreography. Uh, this institution was, uh, is, uh, is human made, it is on us to make it, you know, fit for purpose, to make it respond to the challenges to the 21st century. The UN was created 76 years ago. Of course, the geopolitical reality has dramatically changed. Therefore, institutions need to adapt uh, to new realities. And, and that is the challenge that we, that we have. That's why the upcoming uh, World Health Assembly is so important. Uh, the discussion on, on the new uh, uh, pandemics uh, uh, convention or treaty, the reform of WHO, and it is, a, and I fully agree, it is not a shortage of money. It is not a shortage of ideas, of, mm. of proposals. Uh, we are living times of incredible creativity. A, a huge menu of alternatives and ideas. The question is the will, the political will. How is that we make it happen? And we we better, you know, deliver and make it happen because public opinion, because voters, because citizens from around the world are feeling disappointed, and uh, and we cannot disappoint you know, uh, public opinion. So this form of world government uh, at the UN uh, has to be, you know, fit for purpose. And of course, it's not an easy uh, um, task, but we need to, to use this uh, unique opportunity of reinvention uh, to make things happen. I don't know how far we're going to go, uh, uh, how profound the reform is going to be, but something meaningful needs to happen. And it's not only uh, the responsibility of governments, it is the responsibility of universities, of organized civil society, of advocacy efforts, of, of a, a, a clear roadmap also for the private sector. But the private sector cannot operate, uh, you know, uh, on its own, it has to be, it has to have clear rules of engagement. And perhaps that's also something that we're lacking. Um, very briefly on the question of intellectual property uh -huh, and, uh -huh. and how much it, it can harm or uh, innovation. Uh, I, I would say that in situations of emergency and crisis, I think that human lives uh, have to be put over profit. And, and that, is a, that is a basic principle. And if we agree that uh, global health is, is a global public good and a human right, uh, I, I think that uh, this speaks, it's, it's a, a self-explanatory argument. Uh, and I think uh, there is a lot of investment, public money that has gone into the research process, for example, for the vaccine. So there is a need of global solidarity 
of cooperation, of putting human lives over profit. Sorry that I think my answers were very, it was longer than expected, but I think the questions also were very rich and in 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 very broad. So I I try to oh, do my best. Thank you so much. I am available afterwards in case uh, you know there is uh, you know further follow up uh, question. No, thank you so much to make your answer short and precise, but uh, we really appreciate uh, your very thoughtful response. So let me get another question, maybe from Yuta Obusesan. Hello. Yes. Uh, my name is Yuta Obuse and I am Japanese high school student. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think uh, the idea of Corona vaccine passport is currently in the spotlight. And and this uh, this this idea has two merit and the first is this will enable people to travel between countries and second point is it will lead to economic recovery and uh, what do you think about this uh, this idea of corona vaccine uh, corona vaccines possible? Thank you very much. You just can, can, where where are you from? Can I ask you where? From? Ah, I am from Chiba. Chiba Prefecture. Okay, that's great. That's great to get the high school students as well. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Sir, can you ask the questions, ah. Mr. K or Miss K? Yeah, yes, uh, actually, actually, I'm Kato uh, from GPDS and I'm uh, taking this uh, seminar from Japan. Uh, my question to is uh, Miss uh, Professor Miss Spinoza. Uh, to be my to be very short, like uh, to get your uni, uni unified guidance uh, fitted worldwide against like COVID virus. How can we deal? How can I uh, like deal with? Uh, like um uh how can we or how can we help like uh, indigenous people uh who it's less prioritized in uh you know uh, like vaccinate or uh, you know taking actually I think like you uh like uh, ex uh, like a uh, st strong you you strongly claimed like the necessity of the like a uh, like a um, like a uni unified guidance and the plurality of the problem such as our education it it also like messing up the like a uh, like a education blah 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 uh, and I understand that but like if like a there is no like a uh, yardstick to like a uh, like a uh, like a uh, uh, deliver information uh, or about vaccination to the like a uh, uh, indigenous people. It's not uh, like a universal uh, guidance. It, it's yeah, just, could you finish? Yeah, okay. yeah. I I said my question. So. Okay, thank you. And the uh, Mrs. Espinosa, ah, he he Hiroto Uchida san, please. Yeah. Maybe this is the last question. Yeah, sorry for the time. Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Hiroto Uchida, a member of uh, Sofia uh, Alumni Association, and also a, me a me member of uh, Faculty of uh, Science and Technology. And uh, I have one question. And uh, it, it looks the uh, 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 vaccination in uh, African area is quite low comparing to uh, other areas of, of the uh, 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 world. What is the um, uh, main issue to, uh, to, uh, to, pro to pro prohibit uh, uh, the va va uh, vaccination? And this is a question of mine. Okay, thank you. So let me stop here first and the i also have one question maria uh you pro one of the proposal you explained was to to give who or central authoritative systems but what does it mean by that my understanding is that who has just authority to give the guidance right now so when you're talking about giving the who central authoritative 
systems. What, what, what does it mean exactly? So that could be the question from my side. So could you, ex, could you respond to those questions about chin passport and about how to address indigenous peoples and the, and, and the, and the another issue, yeah. Uh, uh, Daisaku, I'm just yeah. seeing uh, Richard Poncio uh, raising his hand mm -hmm. and perhaps a quick round to the panelists as, as well to, to react to the question briefly. I know that we are running out of time, but uh, I, I think that they should also uh, perhaps uh, react very quickly and I'll be glad to, to give like a one minute uh, uh, closing uh, remarks, trying to respond to the, to the excellent questions that were just made. Yeah, we still have a 10 minutes. We still have a 10 minutes because we are supposed to finish by 9.40. But let me ask the Ponzio to respond first and then go to Degu Sensei and, and uh, Takuma Sensei and then go back to the Spinoza san yeah. Okay. Sure, I'll, I'll be uh, yeah. Yeah. very brief and, and indeed, uh, yeah, be nice because I, I'd love to hear Ms. Espinoza's uh, responses building on some of these comments. And, and all, all the questions were excellent, but I especially love the critical ones since the beginning, the trade-off of the economy and the health crisis. This gets to the broader themes that has been at the, at the heart of our discussion. We can't just look at it narrowly as a technocratic mm -hmm. health <laughs> a solution that's needed because uh, somebody just brought up the last question, a uh, previous question about the indigenous peoples, uh, the service sector. What about in the re restaurants and hotels, all those jobs uh, temporarily on hold, maybe lost for good. Uh, the informal economy. These people don't have the opportunity to work from home, nor do they live in countries often that have strong social safety nets to, to protect. So the answer is always uh, striking the right balance, having the right interventions. This is where though the UN and, 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 and various other international bodies um, can help both in the short term and then the, the wider recovery. I think the name of the game, uh, we talked a little bit about intellectual property rights, certainly uh, uh, parts of the world that have not uh, initially produced these uh, vaccines should have the, uh, you know, through temporary licenses that can still address profit motive concerns. But more importantly, uh, the ability to manufacture at as fast a pace as possible can be done. Um, and, but it's also, uh, we're seeing a, men, a tremendous capacity in uh, the countries that are producing these vaccines, including China and Russia, but throughout the Western world. And if um, we can push those out the door much more quickly, there are even sums that are not that significant, 50 to $100 billion dollars. Uh, can get 70% of the world vaccinated by next year. We can meet these targets, but it's going to require tremendous uh, political pressure and, and, and public intervention from within the countries that are producing these drugs. The final point is that uh, one, Mr. Lee from Hong Kong put his finger on, you know, never let an important crisis go to waste, but not just in the health space. Uh, there are 16 other sustainable development goals. And, and we're talking a lot about the UN today. It has two other major pillars, the human rights, rule of law, democracy pillar. There is a pillar on peace and security. This is a time for monumental change across the system because once again, these issues cannot be addressed in isolation. They're all interconnected. I'll stop there. There's one person who raised a question, Makoto Suzuki-san, could you finish by one minute? Sure, thank you very much. And I just wanted to ask um, Ms. Epinorza that um, many governments and organizations are more focusing on preventing COVID-19 pandemic, but forgetting about many problems happening in the world. So I just wanted to ask like how, like including Japanese government, how do all governments can focus on the other problems that are happening all over the world? Thank you very much. That's good. So, no, that's wonderful. So let me go back to Deguchi Sensei and then go to Takuma Sensei. I will also make try to make one or two minutes comment for as a final comment and then go back to the Maria. Okay. Deguchi Sensei, please. Um, well, thank you for giving me more time. Uh, when Mr. Aponzio mentioned the, the word collective action, um, you know, I, I realized that, you know, maybe 
you know, I mean, I, I also study, you know, how do we get to, how do we get uh, people in dominant groups to uh, become allies in collective action? And there's four sort of um, factors, one of which is um, anger at the injustice, uh, strong ident identification with the target group that is facing the injustice, a uh, sense of moral justice, and finally, the sense of collective efficacy that you know, doing that, taking collective action will make the impact that it does. And so, I just wanted to sort of, you know, end with that, and hopefully, um, I mean, you know, you might be able to apply in this situation. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much, and thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Ponzio, for reminding me of that concept. <laughs> thank you very much. No, this very profound comment. Uh, and the Takuma Sensei, could you give uh, us some in? Yeah, general thought. Yeah, part. yeah. Uh, I I do not have um any um, any um, special point, but uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, we are discussing the problem, which do not have the, the uh, you know that um, uh, easy the, the uh, easy you know the solution. But mm -hmm. uh, I think it's important to continue the discussion. And uh, from my point, from my perspective, I think the uh, you know that um, middle powers like uh, Japan or Germany or France would be would have um, a great uh, have um, a key roles in the, the global health governance in the post post uh, COVID nineteen global health governance. So, yeah, I we look forward to uh, continuing the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me share one of my thoughts for maybe one or two minutes because we have three, five, five minutes. And the, actually I have a chance to, to talk or to make my own lectures about what could be the role of Japan to make a global solution to the COVID pan pandemic in the last September for the parliament uh, working group uh, led by Yoko Kamikawa who was a a minister of legal issues uh, last September. And I emphasize that maybe it's very important for Japan to play a critical role to support the COVAX, uh, because COVAX is the only mechanism to distribute the vaccines to, to the developing country, at least that we, we set up. So I propose that Japan should pay almost same amount of the money with the EU, like a 500 million US dollar. And also maybe Japan should host some international conference about COVAX to promote the you know, global awareness and the cooperation on, on, on the COVAX. And the, actually I made this kind of proposal together with Professor Takuma Sensei, who is actually my teachers on these particular issues. And the, in the end of the day, after nine months, I don't know how my our proposal could have some difference, but at least Japan hosted the COBAS International Conference in this June, and they pledged almost uh, 10, no, 1 billion US dollar to contribute to the COVAX. And the many member states also contributed to COVAX. So I heard that the now COVAX collected about 10 billion US dollar, which is enough to, to vaccinate 30% of the, uh, all of the people in the, in the developing countries. But we need to have more and more money, maybe more 10 or 20 billion US dollar to vaccinate some 70% of the population in the developing country, which Marina mentioned. So uh, one problem is about political, but I, I agree with you that it's a really political issue because I heard that the, all over the world used more than about 100 billion US dollar just to maintain the nuclear weapons all over the world. So we have the money, but the question is how we have a political will to vaccinate all of the pe peoples in, in the world. So maybe that could be one of the conclusions and the, but that, that could be one reason why it might be important to have that kind of global conversations to create that kind of political will. So Marina Sensei, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, floor is yours. You have maybe five minutes to, to conclude and, and we will finish. Uh, wow, I, I think that uh, your suggestions uh, are, are great, uh, Daisaku, and I really hope that they're implemented and your words are wise. Uh, the money is there and uh, it's about prioritizing uh, what do we want the world to be? What is 
uh, how do you see, do we see our future, especially for uh, the generations to come? And it's up on us, uh, you know, what what to do. Um, basically, I will use my five minutes, uh, one minute to to respond to the many questions. I'll try my my best. Uh, why uh, the vaccination in Africa is so low? Uh, we have to say that. Um, the situation in different countries is uh, varies, but in general terms, uh, you know, Africa is not monolithic. The, the situation of uh, uh, the uh, sub-Saharan Africa uh, is, is really critical. Uh, in the case of South Africa, uh, the, the rates of vaccination are going up. Uh, there are some countries that are, are uh, doing a, an incredible job, like Rwanda, for example. So uh, the, the situation varies, but I have to say that the secret is not only access to vaccines, but to have a proper health infrastructures for the deployment of the vaccines at the national level. And in some countries are showing tremendous weaknesses in installed capacities. And that's why uh, they are in need of international cooperation and solidarity. So uh, this is basically what explains the 1% in, 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 some, in some countries and in countries in conflict. Uh, also the rates are uh, uh, extremely low. So there is a direct correlation between poverty between low performance in uh, implementing the SDGs and the immunization efficacy. So that, that basically to, to, to simplify a very complex uh, reality. The question on indigenous peoples, um, it, it is true and it, this is extremely sad that uh, areas uh, with a, in, a presence of indigenous peoples, indigenous uh, territories, uh, for example, in South America, in the Amazon basin, uh, these areas uh, have shown lower levels of immunization as well, because the same reasons uh, than in Africa, exclusion, marginalization, it comes together with low levels of immunization. And, and unfortunately, uh, um, indigenous peoples are the poorest of the poor and they're marginalized. And we see uh, that, that is a fundamental structural uh, ra racism and exclusion that happens uh, in countries uh, with indigenous uh, peoples. But, you know, another chapter, I will explain the resilience, traditional knowledge and incredible uh, capacity of indigenous organizations. I have followed that uh, from, from uh, uh, closely. And this um, false dichotomy is whether we recover the economy or we control the pandemic. It's an either or scenario. We open the economy or we control the, it's not an either or because if people continue to die, you know, there is no way you're going to recover the economy. That's why uh, Kristalina Georgieva and others say, uh, basically the wiser macroeconomic policy is vaccination and immunization. That is the step one before we open the economy. So it's not, you know, I think that there was one question on, on that. I really like the four, four factors for collective action and that Professor De Gucci mentioned. I think they're, they're, they are right on. And perhaps, you know, just to close, I, I would like to make perhaps Three, uh, three reflections. Uh, the challenge, I, I think that the challenge we have is to make the COVID catastrophe and pandemic being a literacy experience to learn what are the things that we should not repeat in the future. Uh, what are the things that we need to improve so we are better prepared and well equipped? And that goes from, you know, having a plan B for the working methods of the United Nations. At the beginning, they didn't even know, you know, how to have virtual meetings at the UN, how to take decisions. It is not written. We need a wide book of working methods in situations of crisis for the UN. Just that particular example, but we need to learn on the, you know, positive things like, for example, scientific cooperation and the 
development of a, a vaccine in one year, how that, that happened and how to expand that positive experience. What are the things we need to do better? How to improve our global governance system in a very particular area. So that's the number one. The number two is I think we, we face an incredible challenge. And the challenge is the challenge of simultaneity. And uh, one of the, uh, the, the persons asked the question, we are forgetting about all the other problems we have. We are only putting our focus on COVID and COVID recovery and, and COVID immunization, but we have other problems. The, the issue is that what the pandemic did, it, it was like a magnifier glass effect. Because of COVID, we woke up and realized uh, the climate crisis because it's worse. Um, the inequalities crisis because it's worse, uh, the, the weakness of our social protection net because it's become worse because of unemployment. So it was a, a way of looking closely of what are the structural flaws in our societies. And it means that we need to act in all these fronts at the same time. It is not an easy issue. But uh, the, the issue of complexity, of a holistic approach, of understanding that and remembering that COVID is a zoonotic disease. It's the way that nature has to speak to us and say, you know, just respect the boundaries, respect the limits. So it is a wake up call for humanity. Decision makers, political leaders have, you know, to operate as an orchestra again. You know, a green and fairer and more inclusive recovery, yes. Immunization, yes, at the same time. Improve our um, governance systems at the national, but also at the international level and, and, and do a refurbishing, uh, a retooling at the same time. No, everything happening together. But I think that in, in the perhaps uh, the third and last thing is, is the issue of regaining trust mm -hmm. in institutions, in politics. So public citizens feel protected, less anxious, less desperate about an uncertain future. Uncertainty, uh, despair, and, and, and uh, trust need to be um, mended, need to be restored using this crisis, uh, again, as I, I, I said, as a, a, as a literacy experience. So I, I would just uh, leave it there, um, dear friends and, 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 and dear Daisaku. Uh, it's, it's not an easy, there is no straight answers. Yeah. And, and we need to, to work uh, together. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I hear governments should do this and that and leaders should do this and that in a very prescriptive way, which is true. But I think that we, we have to come together as humanity, as, 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 as a community to uh, contribute uh, for these all encompassing, complex, holistic, multiple simultaneous kind of response. These are big words, but that's exactly what, they were, uh, what, that, what the world needs. And, and, and especially being responsible with the future generations, I would say. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. No, that's wonderful. And a very, 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 very emotional, but very inspiring uh, uh, final comment presentation. I just got the comment from the student in the Russia, which really appreciated our discussion. So yeah, we have a, we are living in the politically divided world, but in terms of our humanitarian wish to protect ourselves and protect our family should be quite common or global values that everybody will share. So I think, and I hope that we can keep having the conversations uh, across the world so that we can have a common and global solutions to these issues. Uh, so thank you very much. Ah, Teresa, do you, could you give us some few comments for maybe one minute? Yeah. Sure, thank you. And this was very inspiring. Not, not easy, but I'm very encouraged you know, to see a bunch of people 
tonight who are really seriously thinking and committing to uh, making the change. This is very encouraging. So thank you for the strong commitment. Thank you. And also I agree, I fully agree with Maria that we should expand the positive side of this pandemic. It's just beyond imagination that we can have that kind of session with Maria together with the person from all over the world just two years ago, because I never knew the Zoom and <laughs> online session. So we are living in a different world. It's, it's, it's the same with uh, Richard Ponzio. So yeah, we hope uh, we can, we are connected at least now. So we hope uh, we can continue to have this kind of discussions so that we can find the uh, uh, solution together. So thank you very much again. Uh, I need to leave here. I need to finish uh, this session today, but I hope we can continue to have that kind of a dialogue. Thank you very much, Maria. And uh, thank you very much for all Richard, Degu Sensei, Takuma Sensei, and uh, Tori Sensei. And thank you so much, uh, all the participants uh, who come to this seminar from all over the world. Uh, maybe if you like, please make a reaction <laughs> or, uh, or, or, or a clap. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a great, and have a great day and have a great night. <laughs>